Tuas Rina and uh, after Marika Pat uh, Kolania and that's it. <laughs> so uh, to start, like before we start, I have to say uh, Poland's Chinese is perfect and all the guys in the Filmolia is just perfect. I hope one day I can like my smile could be as good as yours. <laughs> yeah. So uh, first thing I wanna say is like one last day at you ask. Thank you for bringing us a good feel. And as a Chinese I feel really, really touched like speaking Mandarin with you in Somali week festival and watching a film like in Mandarin, like it is so beautiful and to see so many Chinese elements in the film and we are showing it in front of all the Somali audience is just perfect. So I have seen that you you talk about themes such as transnational marriage in China, uh, studying in China, doing business in China or like pursuing a dream in China. Like how did you decide to fight the themes and why did you choose these people? All right, thank you very much, Sabrina. And I must admit, your Somali is much better than mine. <laughs> yeah. But I'm guessing if you're with uh, Professor Orwood, in a couple of years, you'll be really exceeding my Somali capabilities. <laughs> so um, the documentary film, uh, the documentary film, actually, the way we came up to filming it is kind of different. We're not filmmakers by profession. By profession, me and my co-director, Zhang Yong, we are researchers in a, in a research institute. It's called the Institute of African Studies. And uh, I research communication studies, and I look at diaspora communities and their media consumption, and, the, and how their identity construction comes into it with regard to the, what media they consume. And my friend, or my colleague and co-director, Zhang Yong, researches African cinema. And one day he approached me, uh, that was actually at a conference before I graduated uh, from my PhD, and he had this idea of making a documentary film about the lives of the African community in China. The reason for that was, um, mostly right now, the films that we see in media, or the, the media reports that we often find speaking about the lives of the African community in China are almost always controversial. They always speak about the negativities, about people being kicked out of the country, about people being refused uh, visas or other racial issues, but nobody speaks about uh, the stories, the struggles, and the, their ways to adaptation, and also the good things that happen to a lot of the African community that come to China. So a lot of them do come with nothing and they end up you know, building uh, very reputable lives. So it was actually more of an ethnographic research. So uh, we embarked on this research and looking at the African community in the city of Iwu, what characteristics make them different than the general African community in China or in other cities such as Guangzhou. And we really found that it was a completely different kind of community than that that we find in Guangzhou. And we wanted them to voice their own stories. So you see in the film, um, we, we're just following them throughout stages of, of throughout one year and a half. And after following them for that long and just going through there with them, experiencing a lot of things with them, then we wrote the script and we edited it. So you see that each character is just telling their own story because I'm sitting there and talking to them. So it's just a conversation. We're just having conversations and then through those conversations they're telling their own stories and we then weave that into a film, a montage of over 20 different characters uh, telling their own stories. So there are uh, in total 20... Actually 24. 24 five. Can you describe like yeah. how many women, how many men, like where do they come from? Okay, so the film is uh, basically divided into six episodes. Each episode is half an hour long yeah. and each episode has three stories. So in the end, the, do the series, the documentary series that we have only features 18 characters. 
However, there's an international version. This version is for the Chinese market. Uh, but there's an international version that's going to have subtitles in it. Uh, that version would have about 24 different characters. And they're from, let's say, about a dozen countries, 12 countries. And the, the percentage of women, to be honest, is very low. There's only about five women, only about five female stories, and the rest of the stories are male. Uh, I am quite interested in the, the use of story because transnational, especially for a Chinese woman to marry a foreign person, is quite an issue in China. Like, do you have an opinion on that? So, um, China has had a continuous culture of about 5,000 years, and they're very, very protective of their own cultures, and, and they really don't like to lose that. So in a sense, families don't really like to let their daughters or sons marry from different countries. Now, let alone marrying somebody from a different skin color or, or a different um, religion or a different culture. That would mean that the child would, be, would lose their own original culture. So parents are usually afraid of these things. Uh, and in Yusuf's story, Yusuf, Yusuf actually, I've known him for about eight years now. Um, he used to study in my university and he met Jami and they were together for about six years and then they decided to get married. However, Yusuf actually comes from Dar es Salaam. He's, he's from the city. He's a city boy. But Jami comes from a village, a very small village uh, in, in Zhejiang province. And when they approached the family, the family almost, like she said, they almost exploded. Uh, the mother, the first thing that she said, he is so black, <laughs> he is so ugly, why would you marry him? Couldn't you find anybody else? And, you know, Yusuf did a very amazing thing that really inspired me. And when I wanted to make this film, I remembered him first. It's because he didn't choose to go against the family or fight them or say, we're going to get married no matter what, let's just forget about what the family thinks. No, he said, I'll give them time to get to know me, and then we will see. So throughout that year, when they decided to get married, and until they got married, it was about a year gap, he used to go to that village all the time. And like you saw, he used to help the grandfather. They don't, the grandfather doesn't even speak Mandarin. He only speaks the local dialect, which is different from Mandarin. So there's no communication, right? But he's helping him. He used to help him with the farming, he used to help him with all of the work that he's doing around the house. And at the same time, he's, he would cook, he would, he would treat the parents in a very kind way. And in the end, uh, I was very touched by something that Jiaoming's mother said. She said, after a year of watching Yusuf, I found that he would be better for my daughter than a hundred Chinese men. And in the end, and in the end, she agreed to let them get married. And actually, this wedding that you saw, it was it was the parents who threw the wedding. They threw them a very, very big wedding in that tiny village, and they called everybody in the village to attend that wedding. So that's that was the most touching story for them uh, in, in our film. So have the Chinese wives been back to Africa with their husbands? Um, yes, a lot of the Chinese wives do go to Africa. However. In Yusuf's case, the mother made Yusuf promise that they would live in China forever. That she, because she only has that daughter, so she didn't. She doesn't want her daughter to go away. So she made him promise that they would live there. However, uh, there is still a huge population of Chinese and African intermarriages who also end up uh, going back to different African countries and living there. Another thing I think most of the audience wouldn't understand is like there are two special, very, very Chinese things in the movie. One of this is the yi wu, like small items, it's kind of like a lot of stalls kind of thing. And the other thing is the association of yeah. commerce. Yeah. Uh, can you just introduce that? Like why did you pick that kind of thing into your documentary? So, um, Iwo is a very interesting place, and the reason why uh, we chose to make the film about the African community in Iwo is because Iwo is a business city. 
Uh, I'm sure a lot of you haven't heard of it. Perhaps most of the cities you hear about are Shanghai, Beijing, right? Mm -hmm. However, Yiwu is about four hours away from Shanghai and it is a commercial center. So if you're a businessman, of course you know Yiwu because you get all of these small commodities from Yiwu. Yiwu has a huge market, we've seen pictures of it. That market has 40,000 stalls, 40,000 shops. So I'll give you a statistic that will give you an idea of how big that market is. Statistics say that if you spend only three minutes in each shop in this market, it will take you three years of walking nights and day to go through it all. That's how large it is. And it sells a lot of very different and variable things. You can find almost everything there. So a lot of businessmen from all around the world come to Iwu in order to do business there. And a lot of African, young African people, they came to China, they learned Chinese. And they make a living or they make a business through helping these businessmen navigate the city and navigate this market. So that's one reason. Uh, so Iwu hosts the second largest African community in China, which is estimated <laughs> at about 30,000 people. 30,000 people living in Iwu for, um, and settled there now, let alone the people who come every year and go. Uh, and as for the um, Ahmed story, the Sudanese, uh, the Sudanese merchant who uh, registered the EU Association, China, China is very different. China has very strict rules with regard to registering uh, international associations. So if you have an NGO, it's very difficult for you to register it in China. It's almost impossible. Um, so, in order for them to have a community association, as the Sudanese Commercial Community Association, um, it was almost impossible for them to get it registered to become a legal entity that they can do a lot of activities through. So, Ahmed really went through a lot. He chased this thing for about five years in order to get his association registered. So, it kind of feels like a miracle. Uh, and like he said, his association was the first international association or merchant association to be registered in the city of Yiwu. Uh, so you've been in China for 12 years, right? Yes. Do you think, uh, are there any like changes like, in terms of how Chinese people treat Africans or how they think? No, to be honest, no. The reason why I actually, instead of joining big international companies or big international organizations after graduation, I chose to join a university and join a research institute that researches China-Africa relations. The reason why is because throughout these years that I've been living in China, there's one constant thing that hasn't changed, which is the understanding of the general Chinese population about Africa and African people and African cultures really can't measure up to the level of them opening up to the international community. So there's a gap in knowledge. Uh, when you say to someone, um, I'm from Somalia, the first thing that comes to their head is pirates. They actually say that. When you say, I'm from Somalia, the next thing they say, oh, hai dao, which yeah. means pirates. And if you tell them Somalia is in South America, they will say, oh, really? Oh, I didn't know. So the lack of knowledge is, is actually quite surprising to the level of opening up. So this is something that hasn't changed. However, the country is developing quite faster than you could imagine. The EU, the first time I went there was in January 2006. Half of the city, right now, half of it was just fields, rice fields. In 10 years, we've got high rise buildings and all of these things that you just saw. So the, the pace of development and changing is very, very fast in China. And if you're away from your city for one year, you come back, it would be difficult for you to recognize the city. And that's how fast it's changing. And people are also changing. Um, my friends in university used to tell me that growing up, uh, I grew up in Saudi Arabia, and when I was 10 years old, we had color TV and we watched everything, right? My friends, who are my age, when they were 10 years old, they didn't have color TV. They didn't have color TV. That's how poor China was. But right now, 
In Iwu, this city, which is only a thousand square kilometers big, has the largest number of luxury cars in China. So you're driving down and all you see are Bentleys and and all of these Lamborghinis and huge extra build, uh, extra driving cars. So uh, I, there's one thing I want to say is like uh, yeah, I totally understand Chinese people are a little bit like ignorant on African literature, African like everything related to Africa. Um, but uh, there is a university in Beijing called Beijing Foreign Study University, and <coughs> last year they have established the first like Somali call, uh, faculty, and they have like invited three or four teachers from Somalia, and they came to China to teach the students the language. Yes, yeah, this is a pretty good thing for me. <laughs> How is it like to work with Chinese people? <laughs> oh my god. It's really difficult to work with Chinese people. <laughs> Not difficult in the sense that it's hard for us to understand each other. No, I think I'm more Chinese than Somali yeah. right now. No. The difficulty is keeping up with them. So, me and my colleague, just an example, Zhang Yong, who is the co-director of this film. Zhang Yong comes into the office 7 a.m. He doesn't leave until 10 a.m. And he's busy throughout the day. He maybe takes a one hour break during lunch, another hour break during dinner at 12 o'clock and 5 o'clock p.m. And he works seven days a week. And he expects the same of me. So in the past two years, I haven't had a weekend. And I literally work every day from 7 till sometimes 10, 11 p.m. And even after I go home, there's more work I need to do. So I sleep less. I eat less, I exercise less, because the pace of, of work is just like that. And our institute is just busy. There's no concept of today's a holiday. There's no concept of today's a Sunday, or there's no concept of I'm a girl and I need to wash my clothes. <laughs> that concept doesn't exist. So there's work to do, you have to go and do it. So just keeping up with the pace of work and how people move is just very difficult, especially for us who, you know, my mother calls me and she calls in the afternoon and I say, Hoi, Lanshadania, can I call you back? She calls again five hours later and I Hoi, we didn't mind the She calls again before I'm sleeping and I'm like, Hoi, I'm so tired and I have to wake up early tomorrow. Can I call you tomorrow? So the day, the day just goes that way. Uh, like, how many years did it take in total to shoot this? So we began filming in May 2016 that the first shot that was taken was actually the first story, which is mine. I was the first character to be filmed, uh, which was my graduation ceremony. Uh, it was in May 2016 and we only shot the last shot in D September 2017. So right now we haven't really released the film yet, but we've uh, screened versions of it in the Zanzibar International Film Festival. And it was also chosen as the opening film for the Lusaka International Film Festival. We've also premiered in China. Uh, and inshallah ta'ala, we're hoping that uh, it will continue to, to have a, a good response all over. Yeah. Yeah. There are like really unforgettable obstacles in that. Time. My God, yes. So this film, like I said, we're not filmmakers, we're university lecturers and researchers. So uh, the film was funded by the university, by our research institute. So you can imagine making a film like this and you have to follow the lives of over 20 people. That means what? That means today one character will say, my son is sick and in the hospital. So you say, okay, I'm coming. You take the car, you take the crew, and you go and you film. And you've been through that through uh, two years. So the budget that we need and the budget that we had had a great gap in between. This is one thing. Number two, all of the equipment that we use, the cameras, the microphones, and everything, we had to buy them ourselves. And the Chinese financial system in the universities is kind of very complicated. So that means, yes, that means that you have to 
first of all, buy everything yourself. And then you bring the receipts, and then you go through the process of reimbursing the money from the university, which takes a very long time. So basically, we had to put in our own money, first of all, to buy all of this equipment, and we, had the, we ran the risk of actually our receipts not being accepted sometimes. I know. So it was, the financial side of it was difficult. And the second thing is, most of our crew were students from our university and colleagues. And with students, they would work with you today and tomorrow, but maybe the third day they'd be tired and exhausted from this kind of work. And they'd think, and they'd think um, I don't want to do this anymore, and you need to find someone new and train them again. So this was another obstacle. And the third most important obstacle is the politics in China. The politics in China doesn't allow us as filmmakers to show anything related to religion or anything related to, yes, that. So um, there's, there's something very special about Iwu that I actually like, which is when it's Eid, you know what happens is the city government dedicates the entire road that goes to the mosque, we have a very big mosque, and they don't allow anybody who's not Muslim to drive through there during the whole day especially before going to the prayers, in order not to cause, you know, zahmet um, or congestion in the street. We wanted to film that, we wanted to show that, we wanted to show how even the city is adapting to the people living in there, but we couldn't, so that's just an example. So, um, so, so navigating through the politics and trying to still show and tell the story the way you want to tell it, while still being politically correct, is also one of the difficulty. Yeah, but like personally, I still hope it is not only the negative things you see in the course, yes. Yeah, I, and I still personally uh, invite all of you one day to come to China. Yeah. There are a lot of great things in this country. <laughs> yeah. Now, and I will give the platform to the audience, and like anybody want to ask something about the, uh, about the film, you could just shoot. Can we open the lights? Thank you. The Somali community generally in China isn't that large. Uh, there's an estimated about 5,000 Somali students not right now studying in China, and a little over 200 businessmen living across China. In the city of Iwu, there aren't that many students, but there are a lot of businessmen, about over 100 established businesses, uh, doing very different things. Uh, there's actually a, a Somali a uh, businessman who owns a factory that produces underwear, men's underwear, and he sells it to the Chinese market. I really wanted to film his story, but he, he was skeptical about filmmaking, so we didn't. So, um, the small community in Iwu, also for one thing, we're not really, we're not really a community. Like, for example, the Sudanese community, they come together, they have an association, they do everything together, but we are divided. Uh, and it's a sad thing, and it's a sad thing. But, um, but yeah, basically it's just two different types. It's either students or businessmen. Another question?
Yeah, because Julia was telling me, yeah, uh, in, um, in the early days in Somalia, uh, National University, that's where you're in Thank you. Um, just to correct you, that ambassador is no longer the ambassador. Right now we have a new ambassador in Somalia, and he doesn't speak Chad Somali. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I think the case is just general ignorance about the outside world. Uh, China is open, but it's also kind of closed in a way. Yeah. yeah, It's kind of open to the world, but it's still closed in a way that um, people still don't really have that much access to the transnational community and transnational cultures. This is one thing. The other thing is, although China has 54 different ethnicities and minorities, however, the dominating culture is the Han culture, which is about not over 90%. Yeah, I am actually a minority myself, but I'm pretty Han. Yeah, but she's already Hanized, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so the Han ethnicity kind of constitutes about 90% of the country, which means it's a monolithic culture, which means everybody kind of, you know, has the same pace of thought and culture and life. So for them to accept something foreign or something different is very difficult, extremely difficult. So it's not just the fact that it's African, it's actually the fact that it's foreign, it's different, and their ignorance towards it, that's what makes it difficult. But it's changing, of course, right now. Yes. Any other questions? One second for the mic. I have to do one last question. I've been told. All right. I felt that every day I learned something new in China. And one of the most important things that I learned is that in China, governance has a different concept. Governance is geared towards governing the people and ensuring that the people are living a happy and prosperous life. So it's politics of development rather than politics of ideals. So what does that mean? You, I'm, I'm very happy that you brought up Djibouti and Ethiopia. These two countries are actually very interesting. About, you know, along with the Rwanda, these countries have chosen a path of politics of development. So they gear their political thought and all of their governing efforts towards developing the country. I'm not just gonna say through industrialization, like what Ethiopia is doing or what Djibouti is doing. No, it's, it's gearing all factions of the government towards one single goal, developing the country. Making sure that everybody has food on the table. Making sure that they are independent of the aid that's actually straining the country in a different way, yeah? So in Somalia, no matter we are, if we are in Somaliland, if we are in Butsiland, if we are 
wherever, as long as these governments realize that the role of politics or the role of politics that they would choose would be politics of development, I'm sure we can all sit on one table and find the right partners, whether they're China or they're other Southeast Asian um, partners or even Western partners, to do one thing, which is develop our country. Develop, even if we're just developing our city. As long as we are making sure that we have electricity, running water, we have roads, we have the infrastructure. And we strive to get these things instead of striving to just get on the seat of power. Yeah? I think that would actually be useful for our government and our country. I have I was sort of funky, never see it. I was a rally. I had a Somali and Tahibo. I say, well, I had a lot of people who were Shira in Unordo, or get one bar or Somalia. Shan, she, shan, she Thank you very much. Um, 
In the 1970s, Deng Xiaoping came up with a plan to develop key areas, key coastal areas in China, and that China's development would begin, first of all, from these areas, and then it would spread to the rest of the country. So you would find areas like <coughs> Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Shanghai, these places are the most cosmopolitan and the first areas to open up to the rest of the world and open FDI, foreign direct investment, and with such open up into a culture, a foreign culture or a cosmopolitan culture. So these areas you would see, if you're in Shanghai, you wouldn't tell the difference. You would, you would think that you're in France or you're in New York. You wouldn't tell that you're in China, actually. The amount of people walking down the street, you see all different colors of people, just like London. Uh, and also the culture there, the business culture there, the li living there. People are a lot more open-minded and they're a lot more uh, accommodating, yeah? So, but as you go in, because of development being in stages, as you go in throughout the city and you go to the east or uh, to, the, to the western side of it or the inlands or the middle side of the country, you would see that it's still it's yet to get to where you would like it to be. So like you said, China is a huge country with a huge population and we shouldn't just put one label on it because um, I think it would be unfair. The same way that it's unfair to for the whole world to just Somalia by just one region, yeah? So um, I hope that answers your question. One last question. One last question. My question is directed to... Uh... Sabrina? Yeah. I just want to ask you how uh, how did you get involved in this money culture, and what is your background? Well, actually, I am one of the students, like uh, the university I just mentioned, and uh, they just sent Chinese students abroad to learn the like rarely spoken languages, such as a lot of African languages, and they help us to learn the language well to be an expert on that. And one day, I could go back to China and to teach. The languages. So like now I'm doing so, like once I get into the language and I get into the culture. Like now I'm really really interested in Somali poetry and the, the modern Somali women poets. So I'm doing their work and I hope once I go back, like Chinese people will be like less ignorant. At least they know there are poetry in Somali language and Somali. There are like a rich culture in Somali and not just. Pirates. Thank you for shooting such an incredible movie and sharing with us today. For those who have further questions, you could discuss during the break, right? Yes, one last thing. Uh, inshallah, Ta'ala, if you want to follow up on the film and when it's released and how it's released, you can go onto our website, Africans in Evil. Africans in EYIWU. Inshallah ta'ala, all the latest news will be posted on that. And on a very last note, I would like to thank everybody who made it here. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope to And I'm really sorry that the film had a bit of technical issues because it was playing from a stick. And this isn't our final version, it's just the first cut that I brought for you guys to view. So, inshallah ta'ala. Hopefully you will continue to watch and criticize uh, the film Shallow when it's released. And thank you very much. Um,